Hello, everyone. Yeah. So, hello again. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Asa Bazdereva. I'm a scholar and writer from uh, Ukraine. And first of all, I uh, would like to thank uh, Mega and Simon for uh, making this event happen. And for me, yes. Um, uh, for me, uh, especially over the past year, ever since the big war started, but then much more years since it started in 2014, the war in Ukraine, uh, for me, um, often uh, it's very difficult to speak, uh, also because even though I speak a lot and I write a lot, um, but the difficult, the, the it is difficult because oftentimes um, in the times such as now, the war, uh, I have to speak often not as an individual, but as someone who is seen as someone who has to speak for an entire land. And it's a very um, uh, exhausting um, process, but then also uh, finding myself in a situation where I have to kind of be uh, both um, um, you know, I have to show both the, the, the suffer and the struggle, but then also not to be too negative and propose some solutions for how these things can be uh, changed. And it's difficult to be in this position. But today, when I was hearing other presenters speak, and thank you so much for your amazing uh, presentations, it gave me also motivation to uh, continue um, to uh, speak and to write, and uh, I'm very grateful for that, and uh, today in my very short contribution, so I was invited, uh, or my prompt was to speak about creativity and environmentalism in the context of the war. And I want to use that, or I want to start with an um, antagonism in a way, and um, to see antagonism as a kind of productive method to address the topics that we are talking about today. Um, and I want to begin with um, kind of a, um, a little um, memory of me being in Columbia University, uh, just visiting for a lecture in 2017. And then um, I've heard a lecture from Eva Domanska, who is a Polish scholar uh, who is also um, kind of partially teaching at Stanford. And her lecture was about uh, the uh, shift in humanities that occurred, um, kind of the shift between the post-war uh, discourses in humanities and the current discourses in Western humanities. And so she was talking about how after the Second World War, much of the conversations uh, were about uh, trauma and about uh, kind of the, the state, like the humanity as such and also the loss the pain um, and everything that the Second World War uh, brought uh, about. And then she said that over the past 20 years, there is a significant shift about like even how people are talking about what is important. And she said that there is much more conversation about uh, kind of uh, recreation, solidarity, but then often in, in the way that um, kind of we want to think about um, kind of healing and, and, and how uh, the conversations are shaped around building different types of relationships and futures. So overall she pointed at the fact that as opposed to the post-war conversations about kind of pain and trauma and wounds and mutilated landscapes and bodies, uh, the conversations are now became more positive in a sense and people want to speak about positive things. And for me, that was also really interesting, something that I started to think about, um, because again, like many of us come from sites of struggle, right? And um, uh, for me, uh, as someone who is from Ukraine and oftentimes uh, in Western countries, I see this huge gap between uh, the places that are subjected to violence. And, you know, it, you cannot be always positive and creative while also fighting. Uh, and, and then I find myself in other places that want to speak only in positive and creative terms. And uh, this is also something that I find particular um, in the current moment when Ukraine is at war, which is devastating uh, for uh, bodies and lands. And, uh, and already now when Ukraine is at this 
place. Um, uh, we hear often conversations or like questions about how we can rebuild Ukraine, how we can be creative uh, about the land, what kind of solutions we can propose. And for me, um, uh, again, the, 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 I, feel, I, I feel the struggle in this kind of um, very different approaches to uh, the actual processes of erasure that are happening in Ukraine. And then already in this moment when we are fighting, there are these ideas of like, oh, how we, how we, can, how we gonna move past uh, what is happening to the land at, as, as we speak. And uh, my friend, Daria Tsimbaluk, she wrote that imperialism operates uh, through erasure that takes multiple forms, right? Uh, erasure of uh, lands, archives, voices, um, things that are happening and that we might not even know about just because they are not uh, visible, various forms of violences. And when I hear conversations about how to rebuild, reconstruct, start from the scratch, propose new creative solutions, I often feel like it's happening too fast uh, in the sense that an actual struggle is happening and the actual things that were never seen uh, named, um, they are already kind of in the past while new creative solutions uh, come. And my work, uh, in my work, I um, focus on infrastructures uh, deliberately uh, because I, I mean, in my work, I'm looking at how Ukraine is turned into a resource, like the kind of the image of Ukraine as the breadbasket. And for me, looking at infrastructures as forms of uh, media that we can read and look at to understand uh, fast and slow violences uh, is very productive because it allows uh, me to see how these violences are, were created and how they are being uh, perpetuated. And for me, it's also interesting that uh, now when Ukraine is at war uh, and under massive destruction, uh, in, in Europe, there are already like different uh, proposed creative solutions how to reconstruct Ukraine. And these proposed solutions, they actually keep negating the, the subjectivities that are very vocal and has been very vocal in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, instead, uh, there are this kind of bigger um, and greater idea how to make uh, Ukraine, because um, uh, many political projects currently are kind of excited about this new opportunity to create something new in the place of a struggle. And I think for me, kind of what I find, the, uh, the antagonism that I find productive is to see that maybe these uh, new creative solutions like are happening too fast and uh, instead we have to, um, we have to uh, take time and to actually stay in this um, place where we are not uh, trying to run away from the damage that has been done but look into that damage and to, uh, to actually learn from it and to understand um, how to um, what is it that was uh, neglected for many decades? What is it that was a missing knowledge, uh, especially about uh, Russian imperialism? So what this damage uh, can, uh, what we can learn from it, how we can read it. And I think this is, this, this is my kind of uh, proposition uh, to think about something and um, to spend some time um, uh, without creative solutions, but rather to be numb and in pain and kind of, um, understand what this uh, uh, pain is about. And it's not, and I, I wrote uh, a year ago that um, my work is and will never be about trauma. And I, I, and I meant it in a way that, um, especially after the Second World War, uh, the trauma, the discourse of trauma was eventually, I think, kind of unproductively um, instrumentalized uh, in order not to um, to kind of to see the problem in the subject who is suffering, uh, to see the problem like this body as something that is kind of almost pathologized, something that carries the damage. And so instead of uh, looking at something, a land or a body that is being traumatized, um, we can also uh, instead look at the systems that created this damage in the first place and so I think my proposition is to kind of stay with this uh, damage, but not from a pathologizing perspective, but rather through how uh, and what this damage um, is telling us about the slow and fast violences. And I wanted to um, 
uh, respond uh, to, uh, or like uh, add a little comment to a brilliant talk that uh, Anuradha did just uh, before, because um, she was referring to uh, Paul Celan's work about uh, his poetry after uh, Auschwitz, that the poetry is not possible after Auschwitz, and um, and of course we need poetic work to uh, kind of um, process and work through and narrate uh, various forms of injustices and also in this way to kind of um, demand uh, historical justice. But this moment of when words um, cannot work or poetry is not possible, uh, these moments come uh, in the moments of um, kind of ultimate brutality and we experienced that last year in Ukraine. There were particular days, weeks and months especially when we witnessed kind of the, the, the scale of the genocide and the torture. And this was the moment when you cannot speak because writing is bleeding and uh, you, you really cannot say, uh, and this is something that we saw uh, last October with uh, Israel and Palestine, kind of this numbing moment when you, cannot, when you think that words are really unnecessary. Uh, and are not capable of changing anything. Uh, but I think what is important for all of us is to dwell uh, on these moments of impossibility to speak uh, instead of speaking right away or finding words right away um, and to, to stay in that moment and not be very fast uh, in our uh, propositions. Uh, also because again, kind of the, it's also the form of how erasure works. It proposes you to kind of like move um, uh, uh, away from, from the damage. Uh, so, and also imperialism kind of takes away our time to say what we want to say. So I think my proposition is to stay for, for a while uh, with this damage uh, so then we can actually attend to it and, and find proper words. Thank you so much.